All right, as I mentioned, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. These uh, these next couple of minutes we're gonna be spending together is in setting the stage for our extensive support network. Um, this is a 60 minute meeting uh, for us to really just touch at the surface level some of the topics that we're going to be covering um, during this school year as we support our students with extensive support needs. If you haven't done so, drop in the chat who you are, where you're joining us from, and the grade range of the students that you serve. I am Vanessa Lopez, project coordinator here at Imperial County SELPA. I also work with all things related adapted physical education. I'm an assistive technology assessor. I'm part of the statewide grant improving outcomes for multilingual students with extensive, with extensive support needs, with uh, exceptional needs, and am part of this extensive support needs network. And joining me today is my colleague, Jessica, and I'll let her introduce herself. My name is Jessica Crothers Rayotis. I am a coordinator with Imperial County SELPA. I re recently joined this group before I came from um, the extensive support needs as a coordinator within the ICU special education program and then a teacher within one of those classrooms prior. So excited to join and get this group going. All right, everyone. So you'll notice that there is a QR code here on the screen as well as a bit.ly link. And I'm going to invite you to um, go ahead and um, scan that QR code to, again, have access to this slide deck uh, in Google Slides and to save that bit.ly link up there so that you can access it in the future should you need to make reference to some of the tools, resources, slides that we share with you today. So on the agenda on the docket today is just a basic overall understanding on the unique needs of students who require extensive support needs, what some of those effective strategies for classroom instruction look like. We're going to share with you some resources and tools for ongoing support, but most importantly, we wanna give you a avenue, an avenue, a venue um, for you to uh, engage with us in a Q&A session, whether it be uh, by unmuting yourself at the end of the session or by utilizing one of the resources, which is a note catcher slash Q&A document where you can submit your questions so that we can either address them today if it's something we can do so immediately or in the future as part of our four-part series. So one of the things that we want to make sure is that when we are talking about the group of students that we're serving now, we are using the appropriate terminology. Changing terminology, same needs. So in the way, way back when it was SH, severely handicapped, no longer used. Then it became not severe, no longer used. Now we're talking about extensive support needs. And what I want you to remember is this, changing terminology, same, same needs. I also want to call your attention to this other QR code and this link right here. These two links will give you access to a running Padlet uh, where we're going to be compiling resources and tools that support us uh, our roles as educators, as practitioners, working with students with extensive support needs. It will have a collection of slide decks and additional resources to support you in this journey. So let's start getting some of our uh, definitions calibrated. So mild to moderate disabilities, mod severe is what it used to be years ago. That's what it was when I went through my teacher education program. Um, I was a mild, moderate level two. That's a credential that I held. However, now um, there's a very specific definition of extensive support needs for use in this authorization statement. So the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing um, now calls out extensive support needs as when we, as being that when we provide specially designed instruction to access grade level California content standards in the least restrictive environment. So that's the same, right? The educational specialist, however, gives intensive instruction and supports in two or more of the following domains, academics, communication, gross fine motor, social, emotional, behavioral, vocational, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're looking at these supports, we're really wanting to consider the following. We're talking about intensive instruction. So it's not just a modification, it's just not an accommodation, it's not just making some tweaks here and there, but we're talking about intensive instruction in one, in two or more of these domains listed here. The supports also often include 
health, movement, and sensory support. So when we're talking about children who have extensive support needs, we're talking about a very specific group. We're talking about a group of students who typically have disabilities like autism. And we know that autism means a developmental disability that significantly affects verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction. Um, oftentimes some characteristics that are associated uh, with students on the spectrum are repetitive activities and stereotype movements, resistance to, envi to environmental changes, changes in daily routines, et cetera, et cetera. One of the reasons that we want to call this out is because there is a tendency to want to serve students um, the same way as we would potentially have served them in the mild to moderate setting, when in fact they are receiving services aligned with extensive support needs. So we're talking about looking at the range of impacts of how autism manifests in that particular student and knowing that it goes above what it is what is typically observed in perhaps a, a RSP uh, setting, SDC, self-contained classroom setting. Additionally, we want to call attention to intellectual disability. When we're talking about intellectual disability, we're talking about uh, being significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning that exists concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior and are typically manifested during the developmental period. And these, in fact, have an adverse effect to the child's educational performance. So in the past, including when I first got started, the term intellectual disability was formerly known as mental retardation. So again, we're looking at a particular group of students that meet some of these characteristics that are being highlighted here. So if you remember earlier in a couple of slides back, I talked about intensive instruction. And intensive instruction can mean many things to different people. So it's important for us to calibrate our understanding of what intensive instruction is. So when we're talking about intensive instruction in special education, we're talking about a systematic direct approach to teaching core learning areas for students who need more supports than standard instruction. So I wanna call attention to the following words, systematic direct approach, core learning areas for students who need more support. So how is it that these are characterized? Well, it's a three-pronged approach. It's completely individualized. That instruction is tailored to the needs of each individual student. It is also data-based. There's progress monitoring and diagnostic data that are used to inform instruction. And then we also have the concept of increased intensity. And what that means is that some students may spend more time in intervention or be in smaller groups. What does that mean for my teaching? What does that mean for my classroom? Well, that means that if you are engaging in group work, if you are engaging in rotation-based um, learning, you might be looking at smaller and smaller groups because of this whole um, concept of increased intensity uh, and relative intensity as well. What is demanding for one student may not be demanding for another and vice versa. So considering those individualized aspects of what um, that instruction looks like is important. So before we move forward, I also want to really highlight that when working with students who have some of these more significant needs, who have um, a, a need for more extensive supports, oftentimes, especially when we're looking at students whose primary disability may be autism, um, or there is a situation where comorbidity exists, where two or more disability categories are existing at once, um, it is important for us to get to know our students because in their own way, whether with the ability of speech or not, students are constantly communicating with us. And one of the things that are always readily apparent with some of our students are their fascinations. That little guy who shows up with a little school bus, that little guy who shows up with a whale in this case. And I'll get into that really briefly, um, but really the underlying concept is the following, is that when we work with instead of against what students love, they feel safe, happy, and ready to learn. 
So the story of Pedro's whale really highlights that. Here's this young man who is in love with his toy whale, will not part with it. Teacher walks in, behavior specialist walks in, administration walks in, and they are faced with this child having a major behavioral meltdown. And the reason is because the whale was removed. When, uh, when the situation de-escalates and there's time to find out what really happened, what was the trigger? Well, what ends up happening is that Pedro was working well, was transitioning well. The issue was when that whale was taken from him. So instead of really trying to separate him from that whale that was getting him to engage, that was getting him to transition, that was getting him to participate in academic tasks and social-based tasks in uh, all sorts of classroom activity time, um, really a trigger could have become a, a tool. So just using those fascinations and area of interest are super important because when we seek to make that connection with students, then we're really engaging in strengths-based education. And Kim always shares this information because it's really about taking a look at who we are, what we bring into our classrooms, who our students are, what they bring into their into our classrooms, and really seeing all those general dimensions of identity that students bring in. And important for us to also um, have the whole concept of presumed competence at the forefront of our mind, how it is that a child is attempting to communicate with us, to show us who they are, even if we don't fully understand it is important because the end goal is really um, that students can reach previously unattained levels of personal excellence and be able to engage in tasks in the classroom and in their community at large. With that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica so she can walk us through some more specific skills or behavior-based strategies for students in our extensive support needs classrooms. Jessica? Um, thank you. So um, like Vanessa was saying, we really got to get to know our students. And I think that's a huge part is knowing their interests and really using that as a tool. And the other part of it is knowing what skills they need to work on. Um, you know, a lot of our students have maybe similar needs but are kind of come up in different ways whether it's behaviors or um yeah mostly behaviors in the classroom so one area that i there's a couple areas that we chose to look at and one is cognitive um when they're when they need some they have um i don't want to say the word deficit but need support in the area of cognitive skills some behaviors we might be noticing in the classroom are struggling with organization and planning longer short term memory so that retention of um whatever they're learning right? It might not, um, they might not have a, a long-term or short-term memory, sorry. Um, limited reading, writing, and math skills. So really breaking down the learning, memorization, and not understanding those abstract ideas. So being very concrete. Um, some of those skills that those students might be working on, whether it's in their IEPs or just a skill within the classroom, are recognizing emotions. Um, participation and engagement. I think that's a huge focus, especially in the beginning, is just working on engaging that student getting them to participate, to really understand what they know, what their interests are, which, you know, Vanessa had mentioned as well. It's also processing requests and actions. Um, they might have IEP goals in memorization and recall, and of course, those academic skills. But really looking at the skills broken down beyond the academic piece and focusing on those as well, that's a huge part of that, that um, extensive support needs classroom. All right, some of the, you can go to the next one. Some of the strategies and the supports that we can use in the classroom to support in the area of cognitive um, is to eliminate unnecessary elements. We love our beautiful classrooms and it's great when it's providing something, whether it's a sensory input, you know, we have this beautiful um, sensory corner and it really works, but sometimes we, end, uh, we might add things to our classrooms that can be distracting or overwhelming. Also thinking of things such as like the lights in the classroom, are they flickering? Are they too strong for the student? Are, is there a buzz in the classroom that might be um, distracting? So looking at those elements that might not seem like much to you could be very intrusive to a student that might have some sensory needs. We also want to look at re, um, increasing the wait time for re, um, processing. So, you know, if we give a repeated instruction, you know, stand up, stand up. 
stand up, we want to make sure that we're doing some wait time where it gives them time to think about it, give it time to process. Some students might have a 20 second processing time. Um, I'm not going to do it right now because we only have an hour, but just to think about it, time yourself. Ask, you know, give a give a, a prompt such as stand up and give yourself some time to see, does that student react? Um, you know, some students might be 20 seconds. If you just pause, wait, give that wait time, that's a support. You're providing them that moment to respond. It's also um, repetition, Re repetition, 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 um, doing repeated tasks whether it's in the same format or the same you know, content, that helps them as well. Multiple modes of expression, giving the student the opportunity to express beyond a piece of paper, right? We want them to be able to express their, what they know. And most of the times it's not gonna be paper-based. So looking at how can we pull in some manipulatives? How do we do, um, I'm trying to think of different ways, manipulatives using technology, anything like that to kind of increase that, those modes of expression. Um, we want to use concrete directions. We want to be able to show them what is it that we're expecting them to do versus just a verbal direction. There's also the visual, verbal, and physical prompts. Sometimes it's you can provide just a verbal prompt, but then pairing it. Sorry, then pairing it with the visual as well. It's helpful. Does someone have a question? All right. We also have the graphic organizers and then the simple, simple limited choices. So in the beginning, when we're, you know, first starting to get to know our students or even, you know, beyond that, we really want to limit the amount of choices, not leaving it open ended. So instead of saying, what do you want for lunch? You're going to provide them choices. What do you want for lunch? Do you want whatever the choices are, pizza or hamburgers? You know, what do you want to use uh, to write a marker or a pencil? Providing those choices and not leaving it. What do you want? Okay, it's easier to re, um, make a selection. All right, another area is communication. I think communication, communication, communication is a big piece. And I know the speech therapists in the room are probably, yes, you know, this is a huge area. And we see a lot of behaviors expressed because of their lack of mode of communication. So it might, some of those behaviors might just be limited verbal communication. We, not, we might not be getting those verbal responses. Um, maybe no eye contact, not socializing with peers or the adults in the room, um, struggling to read or write, and then a lack of a student uh, communication device. I think that one should have been another one. But anyway, the skills that our students are working towards are expressing. So how are they um, expressing themselves through either speaking, writing, um, letting them, letting us know what they're learning or what they know. The receptive is the input. How are they receiving information? Um, some of the skills they might be working on is recognizing their peers and teachers, their family members, using full sentences and processing requests. Also utilizing whatever communication device they might have. Some of those strategies that we can work on and support, I'm sorry, using supports that we can use is again, the multiple, multiple modalities of expression. So we might have a choice board in the room or a talk button where it's gonna express when they push the button. Um, it could be an AEC device, high tech, low tech. There's so many different ways that we can give our students the opportunity to speak beyond verbal response. Okay. Um, another one is structured activities, giving them the opportunity to engage with their peers in a structured way. Um, different ways to communicate or greet each other, which is like the handshake, the fist bump, and utilizing uh, sentence starters. So I want, I like, I go. Another big piece I'm sure we're seeing in the classroom is the self-regulation. And that um, the behaviors that we might be seeing, and I've, you know, we gotten a little bit of feedback from some districts is this is an area of need, right? The frustration with changing routines. Going back to school is a complete change in routine for our students. So of course, it's very normal to have that in the beginning of the school year. Um, it the difficulty with transition, going from one place to the next, whether it's from the classroom to the cafeteria or from one table to the next, we're seeing, we might be seeing some difficulty with that. Um, struggling with adjustments, which is that change, impatience, difficulty waiting with tur their turn. These are all skills that we can work on. And so skills, like we said with the IEP is turn taking, turn taking, patience, adjusting to those changes and transition. So some of those things, the skills that we can, or sorry, strategies that we can use in the classroom to support these kiddos. Are, if you want to switch, please. Thank you. Is being transparent. 
If there's a change in the schedule, wait rather than waiting to the moment before, start from the beginning of the day or whatever works for that student is we have a change. Today after lunch, we're gonna go to an assembly and accompany that with the visual, put it on the visual schedule. Don't just leave it up in the air as a verbal um, direction. You wanna kind of provide some supports with that. Timers, timers are great. You can use a visual timer such as one right here where it shows the actual countdown or just the number, you know, the, the what is it, digital timer. I guess that's what it's called. <laughs> um, visual again, verbal and physical prompts. You know, using those visual of take deep breaths or wait, stop, all of those are helpful. Um, structured transitions, practicing those transitions ahead of time, right? So that's part of instruction is working on those transitions, especially in the beginning of the school year. That can be part of your instruction is we're focusing on getting from point A to point B. Um, I think that's very common that that's an area that the students do struggle because it is a change, whether it's from a preferred to a non-preferred task, but spending that time on there and using some of these supports will be very helpful in the long run. And of course, repetition. Attention and focus. Again, the behaviors that we're going to be seeing, and I'll rush through this in a little bit so we have time for some more stuff, um, is the difficulty sustaining attention, right? Where students are overwhelmed by making choices. They're um, trouble focusing on a task, sitting and focusing on a task. And some of those skills that the students are working on, so they're not you know, currently doing that, they're working towards it, is that turn-taking, self-control, following those multiple, multiple steps of direction uh, and choice and decision-making. But with all of those skills that the students are working on, we really need to make sure that we're having the supports and strategies in place. Really can't expect our students to learn um, how to achieve those skills without them. You want to go next? And some of those things look like simple and limited choices. Again, that fell under the cognitive as well, is using those simple and limited choices. It can be a visual um, support, a choice board, concrete directions. I think we saw that on every area. Using concrete directions is very helpful. Again, the multiple modalities of expression. It really, these, these supports really fall under multiple areas and help the students overall. Opportunities to take breaks. If a student is, is showing that they're self can't self-regulate, or I'm sorry, or having a hard time self-regulating or um, attending, maybe they need a break. And a break is okay. A break is okay. All right. Um, and then having some type of incentive program, such as a token system. Oh, you know, one more problem, and you get a little star on your token system. But those all have to be taught. All right. So it's really looking at that. Um, reactive and pro proactive approach. And I'm gonna let Ms. Vanessa share a little bit on this, but really looking at what kind of supports can we put in place to avoid those larger behaviors? Thank you, Jessica. So Jessica shared a lot of things for us to consider and also potential areas to work on. And again, that's that proactive approach. That's where we wanna start from. We want to start thinking about how it is that we're going to be recognizing behaviors as communication and also mm -hmm. to look at those behaviors as a means of establishing a baseline. Because if we don't start considering things this way, we have the potential to really fall into a reactive approach. So this slide is a slide we borrowed from today's session mm -hmm. on uh, seclusion and restraint. And it was really a great scenario uh, for us to consider. So I'm just going to go through it really quickly. So this is a real life scenario. Seven year old boy with autism was restrained 16 times in three months due to behavior such as hiding under a desk, refusing to leave the room, hiding in the coat closet, running around the room, crumbling papers on his desk, and making noise. So I want to highlight the following. Restrained 16 times in three months time. That means at least once a week, for those three months, this seven-year-old boy was restrained. As you're processing this scenario, I want you to think of the following, because there is something inside all of us educators 
where we always go for safety. We're always thinking about safety, right? And sometimes behaviors, which are communication, always important to reframe that, can seem like big behaviors that require our immediate attention. And the feeling that if we don't pair attention with action, we're somehow failing or not being supportive or not being in charge or not being responsive or not being the adult in the room. It's important for us to consider the following, that the procedures carry risk, right, when we're restraining. And really, it should be a last resort procedure. Physical restraint procedures are only warranted in cases of clear and imminent danger. Quick question for you, rhetorical too. Walking around the classroom, is that clear and imminent danger? Going under the desk, is that clear and imminent danger? It's important for us to act when the risk of not intervening outweighs the risk of using a restraint. But it is not warranted for any other circumstances, such as compliance or as a punishment. It's important that we recognize that seclusion or restraint for the purpose of coercive discipline, discipline, convenience, or retaliation is not appropriate. And yes, we all know this. We cannot use locked seclusion. We cannot obstruct respiratory airway or impair breathing in any way, shape, or form, which is typically done when a student is placed face down with their hands held or restrained behind their back or weight is put on them when they're face down. And using a restraint for longer than is necessary to contain clear and present danger of serious physical harm to pupils or others. And the reason we put this in here is because it's important for you to know the following, that there are reporting requirements for when we restrain a child or use elements of seclusion as detailed here in this memorandum of understanding from CDE. We are required to report every single instance of restraint and seclusion. And you're probably thinking, well, you know what? I have done that and it's been because the student was in clear and imminent danger. Well, then you're in the clear. You're, you've probably documented that somewhere. That student who had that behavior most likely has or should have a BIP. There should be a goal. You're having meetings to discuss what happened. So it's important for us to consider that um, when we don't take that proactive approach with some of the strategies that Jessica shared with us, there is a high potential for us to end up with scenarios such as this. So it's important for us to be reflective and know what the reporting requirements are and how it is that we can be proactively supporting students rather than reactively engaging uh, with the student's uh, behavior when it's not seen as communication. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to Jessica so she can take us a little bit more through classroom climate so that we can keep on this proactive approach. Jessica? So yeah, so definitely in the proactive, this is thing, these are things that you can get set up in your classroom or um, that have to do with the environment or the way that you run groups to really support those behaviors that we were talking about that might be coming from maybe some top cognitive um, difficulties or those communication difficulties and supporting the kiddos in this way. So one of them is the classroom climate. Looking at how is our classroom environment set up? Do we have those defined areas where students understand the expectation of, this is where we sit for small group, this is where we're sitting for large group. Are we doing the one-on-one -on -one setting where it's kind of blocked off with maybe some tape on the floor? So really looking at the environment, making sure that it's clear to the students what the expectations are. Of course, you're gonna have to teach them what those expectations are, but you wanna try and set it up in a manner that it's understandable. One of the other things is labeling areas. Maybe for our older students, we can do some word labels, um, but most of the time we wanna make sure we're pairing with visuals. Pair them with visuals. It's, visuals can be anything when you're labeling a binder, um, you're labeling the student work bins, you can have their picture along with the visual, the their name. Maybe it's a work box, um, you're doing task bins, you can do color coded um, shapes, but really making sure that you're labeling, but with those visuals as well. Okay. This also includes rules. When you have those expectations for a certain area, set them in there. Put the, maybe it's, 
you know, we don't throw items, have an image of what those expectations are in the area. Other thing is keeping things neat. Every classroom I've been in, it's been very orderly and neat. So that's great to see, but just making sure that it's not, cl it's clutter free. If you feel chaotic in a cluttered classroom, imagine how these kiddos might feel, okay? Um, also, you wanna make sure your data collection is um, organized because if it's not, it's gonna stress you out. And in the, in the end, it's gonna also put that pressure on the students as well. Um, of course, your space is dependent on a, your grade level and the needs of the students. So not all classrooms are gonna look alike, okay? These are just some examples of some visuals that are in some of the classrooms we visited um, right here on the far, Hmm, it's gonna be on the far left. We have, this is a bathroom that's inside of the classroom, but it's still labeled as restroom. And it's labeled in different ways. You have the label on the top, that is kind of the universal label. You're gonna see it around in environments. But for a student that might need a little bit more support, there's a visual of a toilet, okay? And below that, they went a little bit further. There's a, communi not a communication, well, it's a communication device, yep. The student can press that and it says bathroom. It lets the teacher know that they're requesting to go there, use the restroom. Really neat. On the top, we were talking earlier about providing choices. I think in this case, a student kept going to the fridge and would just stand there. Didn't know what they would want, couldn't express what they wanted. So they set this up so then they have two choices. When you go to the fridge, you can either choose to have water or milk and it's supporting them in making that choice, okay? Down below, this is an awesome little um, communication board where the students can request what kind of supports they need. And then again on the right is just for the teacher to use. Where are we gonna go? We're going to, the re going to recess, we're going to lunch. They're using that to communicate to the students, all right? And then we have some more just, again, there's a little cubby there for a calm corner. There are some extra visuals, but in a way it's a defined space because it's a cubby, okay? On the side, on the right-hand side, you'll see where the chairs are, there's a rug. It also is a defined space. It's saying this is where our circle time is. So it can just be a nap in the natural environment and setting up your chairs a certain way, setting up your desk a certain way, or even adding those visual supports just as, such as tape. All right. Again, just some additional visuals, some token systems, and then of course your visual schedule and visual expectations for rules. Um, definitely we utilize differentiated instruction. So we wanna make sure that, and Unique does a lot of this. I know that quite a few of the, from what I understand are using unique learning systems, but providing differentiated instruction, right? We're using our visual supports for our students, more so for some, um, you're utilizing icons on worksheets, color coding, um, visuals to support a process. So washing hands. I'm sure a bunch of you have um, the task analysis of first we're going to walk it, you know, turn on the water, add some soap, scrub your hands, you know, and having those visual supports to support that, that process. And then also the token system, it might look different for different students. You might... The one thing I would recommend <laughs> is not to set up a visual schedule, the same visual schedule for your entire class. Um, you have some students that are gonna need more immediate re um, reinforcements. So you might do five tokens within, I wish I had a picture of a token system up here. You might have five tokens within one activity. Whereas another student might earn five tokens within a day because they can wait that long before they receive an reinforcement. Whereas other students might need them within 10 minutes, okay? So you really need to do it based off of the individual need. Um, look at your student grouping. Some groups might be smaller than the others. You might work on similar tasks together and access to general education setting with supports. Um, a huge thing is no parking. I saw this somewhere and I absolutely love it. Um, differentiated means that no student is gonna be set aside. You're gonna be, you should be able to scaffold and support all students at all levels. And there should never be a student that's aside because they can't do this task right now. There should always be something for all of your students to be participating in um, and involved, okay? Just like that idea of no parking. Oh, here we go. So we have um, a sem somewhat of a token system from my rules at school. The student, once they achieve that they're working for and they're getting five tokens, they would get um, some type of reinforcement, some type of choice. Now, 
This could be dependent on, are they following the classroom rules? As soon as they're sitting nicely, as soon as they're using a quiet voice, they, voice, they might be getting tokens quickly, whereas sometimes they might just be getting it, you know, every 30 minutes. Again, that's a whole, whole, whole training on its own there. Just some visual supports on how groups are set up, and then also you have some visual schedules there. Some additional supports, just ways that we can adapt our curriculum or our work for our students. Uh, whiteboard, using manipulatives, and then also, I mean, if you look on the end, highlighted space for where our students need to cut. The biggest thing, and I'll, the next few slides I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but I just wanted to make sure that we really highlight that every moment is a teachable moment. And I mean, in, in all classrooms, but when we're looking at those extensive support needs, every moment is a teachable moment from the moment they get off the, the bus till they, or from their parents till they go home. So when we're looking at meal time, we're making sure we're working up on opportunities for communication. We're working on opportunities for self-help skills. Um, we really, we want to take advantage of the time that we have with our students. And we're not just sitting back and watching as, you know, our students might be eating food. We're working on getting the request more or asking for help. Um, we're working on them. Maybe they have some mobility needs, working on feeding themselves. So really taking advantage of that. The next one is breaks. Um, you know, breaks, they can look a little different in most, you know, in all classrooms and for each student. Um, but we really want to make sure that they're purposeful. You know, you're using it for sensory or self-regulation. You're using it for movement, getting up, moving so that they're able to sit down and uh, or to participate in another activity. It could be embedded. So you have it within your schedule. You know, every 15 minutes, we're going to get up and we're going to do a brain break. Or it might be not embedded in your schedule. You're going to have a student who all, you know, you're going to start seeing, you know what, he's getting a little antsy. He looks like he needs to get up and walk. They can have that break. Okay. So it can be embedded in your schedule or not. Whole group or individual, like I said, get up, everybody do a sensory break or, you know, as the student needs it. All right. Some, just some options there. Bathroom. Again, we're not working on just shuttling the students through the, through the bathroom. You know, we're working on this one recommends three times a day, but it's up to you on how your schedule looks, but we're really focusing on the skill. You know, maybe we have students that are still in pull-ups or, you know, working on, they haven't been potty trained yet. We want to work on that independence of, are they able to walk to the bathroom? Are they able to tolerate the sound? Are they able to, you know, maybe open the door? So working on those little skills um, all the way up to being able to go independently. So really focusing on that as an instructional area as well. Fine motor development, we, you know, especially in the younger year, the, the younger age, uh, elementary age, um, we should have things that are fine motor. I mean, all the way through, but looking at any fine motor opportunities, especially because we want hands-on learning versus paper-based with this population, um, we can find opportunities to embed those. And these are just some fun activities. All right, cooking. Um, we see a lot of cooking, especially in maybe our junior high, high school, and working on math concepts, working on following directions. Um, maybe they're working on identifying what items they need to buy from a grocery store. There's a lot of different activities that you can do that they can work on skills as well. All right, community-based instruction. Again, you're going to see more of this when you're in the the older years, so junior high, high school, being able to go out and participate in the community from the tasks, the skills that they learned in the classroom. So first, you're working on tasks in the classroom. Maybe it's identifying objects, um, your grocery, um, sorry, your grocery list because you're going to cook, or working on money skills, and then going into the community and practicing those skills, being really intentional about what you guys participate in. It's also called CBI. All right, so those are just some things, um, some strategies to kind of hopefully get you guys going. And we're gonna jump into the inclusive access to FOMA. 
All right, everyone. So we are cognizant of the time, but we want to make sure to give you um, an idea of what it is that we're going to be also covering in those future sessions that we mentioned today. Today, I'm not necessarily going to go in too deep, um, but I do want you to be aware that um, there is an inclusive access to a high school diploma in the state of California. And the purpose of this um, pathway or this uh, inclusive access is to provide high school students um, with disabilities, specifically students with the most extensive um, needs to be able to access uh, a high school diploma just as their peers would. So students with exceptional needs who entered ninth grade in the 22-23 school year or later that are attending any school district, county office of ed, charter school, state special school, can graduate high school through a newly defined diploma pathway as long as the following criteria is met. Number one, that the student is eligible to take the California alternate assessment and that the student is um, completing state standards aligned coursework to meet minimum statewide course requirement for graduation. And it's important for us to know this, especially if you are working in a high school um, setting where the California Inclusive Access to a High School Diploma is a very real thing. The local LEA is going to be able to provide a pathway, uh, a means of accessing a high school diploma like their non-disabled peers. And there are a lot of publications coming out of CDE as this um, new um, guidance is coming out uh, in relation to Ed Code 51 to 55.31. Um, and I've linked that here in the Memorandum of Understanding uh, from the California Department of Edu Education, not as a must know in detail, but just to keep you abreast of some of the information that is coming up as you start hearing talk around um, your LEAs, especially those high schools, where you'll hear that there is the development of a board approved policy. And really what I want to highlight here is that there were many student groups who had some uh, ways of accessing a high school diploma. And the one particular group that was left out because we typically would focus in on a certificate of completion is the alternate pathway to a high school diploma. That is not to say that this is the appropriate um, pathway for all students who haven't been able to access a high school diploma. However, this is an opportunity that is available and it's clearly delineated here as to what those requirements are. Again, more as an informational uh, item than uh, an in-depth analysis specifically today, because I think some of the information that Jessica has been sharing around communication, around task completion, around strategies and activities to have a proactive approach in ensuring success of our students and ensuring that we're understanding behaviors as a means of communication is really more important at this point in time in our journey, uh, working with students in the extensive support um, needs um, programs. But I did want to put that in your radar. I've also linked it here um, on this Padlet. So this Padlet has all of the information that um, I shared uh, with you earlier that Jessica shared with you earlier, and it's going to be a running Padlet with resources that are going to be collected there. So you have in fact a one-stop shop to access all of these tools, websites, documents, et cetera, to support the work that you do. So I really apologize for this 100 miles per hour uh, speed uh, we're taking through it, but we do wanna make sure that we cover very important elements. Um, and then give you that opportunity to engage with our Q&A document to submit any pressing questions. Um, those of you that are new to working um, in the extensive support uh, needs classroom um, may not be full aware that we have standards that are the alternate standards that pick out the most important skills from the Common Core State Standards to teach in a simpler way. They're for providing uh, students with disabilities access to grade level content that is aligned. These content connectors focus on core content, knowledge, and skills. And really what they do is hone in on the priorities in each content area to guide the instruction for students with disabilities. So where in your typical reading um, content standard, we're looking at rewriting expressions involving radicals and rational uh, exponents using the properties of exponents, math, not reading, um, the common core um, connectors, really just call out simplifying expressions that include exponents. 
Here, when we look at writing, the state standard indicates that students will produce clear and coherent writing, uh, which the development organization and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and audience. The content connectors just pull out those essential elements, which include producing a clear, coherent, permanent product that is appropriate to the specific task, purpose, and audience. So really the essential understanding that the standard is intending to establish is that if the student giving us given a specific purpose is able to identify what it is that they are uh, trying to allude to to, a, to an audience. And again, what's not here is the how. So it is consistent with really taking a look at the individual student's ability to communicate uh, and to utilize expressive language. So producing a clear, coherent, permanent product can look in multiple ways. So just really important to consider when you're looking at the common core connectors as you're developing goals and objectives, as you're designing academic instruction for these students, that there are a set of resources that prioritize these connections to the content standards and highlight those essential understandings to make sense of what this learning sequence might, sequence might look like for the student and what curriculum adaptations, accommodations, modifications may be necessary for the student to be able to perform um, in alignment with what those connectors call for. We also know that some of our students are also English learners. And we know that dually identified students, meaning students who are English learners and students with disabilities, also retain all of their Title III protections, which includes access to integrated ELD, designated ELD, and participation in the LPAC or the alternate LPAC. Um, typically, some of our students, if they have the most significant cognitive disabilities, they will partake in the alternate LPAC, um, and the alternate LPAC took the place of the VCAL. So if you've been serving students with extensive support needs who are English learners over years, we know that it's been the v VCALPS consistently. The VCALPS has since gone away. We're now utilizing the alternate LPAC to establish English learner status. And the alternate LPAC is aligned to those ELD standards, but through the, con the core content connectors. And it's an online linear test. It has receptive and expressive language tasks. But what's important here is that when we're talking about students who are eligible for these alternate assessments, the CAA, the alternate LPAC, we're really looking at disability category, step-by-step -step decision points, and using tools to determine instructional need and considerations of additional supports because we really are taking the alternate for all approach. And in the alternate assessment uh, world, we really want to consider the student's individual communication modes. And Jessica shared some, some examples and talked about what communication might look like for some of the students um, that we're serving in this particular population. Some of them might be using Dynavox, some of them might be using switches, some of them might be using uh, picture exchange cards. Communication in receptive and expressive language contexts is very much student specific. And it is inappropriate for us to want to ensure that all students are utilizing one way and one way only. We really want to focus in on that I and IEP individualized and find out how it is that a student communicates best, even though it might not be um, clearly uh, articulated um, by the student in these initial weeks of school as we're trying to get to know them. And again, knowing exactly how it is that the student communicates best is important. And to know that depending on what the task is, what the purpose is, what the context is, this might be done in a, in a combination of ways. It could be gestural, it could be utterances, it could be verbal approximations, it could be through the use of AAC devices. But again, important for us to consider that we are familiar with the students, that we are consistent in our understanding, because even though right now we're talking about the whole assessment process, we know that assessment is a culmination of, um, of instructional practices. And if we are utilizing and considering the student's preferred mode of communication in our day-to-day -day instruction and ensuring that our 
comprehensive ELD, which is inclusive of designated ELD and integrated ELD, takes into consideration how it is that the student best communicates, then we're setting up these opportunities for them to really participate at their ability level in their preferred mode of communication. So all of these resources are linked here just to help you understand how it is that instruction can be scaffolded for this particular group of students. Because what I do want to let you know is that learning is going to look differently, especially if what you're used to is more the mild, moderate setting. And I want you to be comfortable in understanding that, as Jessica mentioned earlier, learning opportunities are everywhere. And one of the ways that we are attempting to support you in understanding that academics can look different ways that learning opportunities, which really is the focus of our work with, um, with our students, is that we have all of these tools readily available. And if in your mind, your um, focus right now is, okay, well, I want to learn how it is that I'm going to do academics with this particular group of students, some of you already have access to some of um, have had access to some of the training that Jessica has provided before. But those of you that haven't, here's a brief um, little overview of what unique learning systems can do for you and for our students. Jessica? All right. So when I talk about unique learning systems, I could probably talk all day. So I'm going to try to be brief. <laughs> but unique learning systems, again, it's um, I know that a lot of the districts that have the extensive support needs adopted this curriculum. You want to go ahead and go on. It's a program that's specifically meant for students with disabilities. It has those embedded supports. A lot of the embedded supports that we've talked about, whether they're visual supports, you know, uh, simplified directions, repeated instruction. It's the differentiated lessons are already built in to a level one, level two, level three, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, it collects data on the student progress and it follows the student. The Unique is a standards-based curriculum. Um, it is aligned with the standards that uh, the Common Core, the Common Core state standards, as well as those alternate standards that we were talking about, which is the core content connectors, as well as the ELD standards. So there are some alignment tools that are um, within the, the unique learning systems that can be looked at. All right, it is it does cover all the way from preschool to transition age. And this just kind of gives you an idea of the skills that you can be working on. And as you see from elementary age to high school, we're working on those core academics. We are still working on ELA and math and science with these students. It's just like Vanessa had said, it looks different. It looks different. We have a lot of supports in there supporting our students in the learning. Um, and it's okay to look different. It, it, it helps the students learn, all right? And then of course, with our transition age, we have some other supports and some other areas. As I mentioned before, it does have the differentiated tasks. We have our level one, level two, and level three. Um, our students that are in the level three might be a little bit more independent. They're doing a little bit of reading. They're doing a little bit of um, performing some basic math on their own. And um, they're within the level three. Level two needs a little more support. They're gonna have, picture supports already embedded. There's um, opportunities for different ways of input and output of information. And level one is we're working on that participation. So earlier we we're talking about how do we, you know, for, to, to focus on some engagement and participation. This really impacts our level one stu students that are at level one. We're working on, you know, are they attending? Are we participating, sitting, maybe turning the page? pointing and matching. And those are some of the skills that you will, you might be working on for a long period of time, but that's that can be an area of focus for our kiddos within the instruction. And a lot of that, as I as it says here, it's built in, it's already automated based off the student's level um, once they take a little assessment, okay? Um, this is just a, an example of the lesson plan that it provides. Um, they are updating them. So this is one of the older ones, but it provides that instructional, instructional target that is that bridge that between those common core state standards and that alternate standards that we were talking about. I love this part where the differentiated task, it really tells you 
what is that student supposed to do when they're completing this activity? If you have that level student that's at that level three, we're asking them to independently answer explicit questions. Okay, level two, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but the big thing is that independence piece. Level two, we're, we see that they need a little more support. These are the students that need those pictures and that text um, to answer any explicit questions. They're gonna need more visual supports and maybe the story read out loud to them. Level one, we're working on our students selecting pictures and text from a story. They're, um, I love this part where they've changed this. It's to active participation response. It's taking into account their different ways of communication, whether that's a voice output device, those AEC devices, or maybe it's an eye gaze. They're able to gaze and look at what, what their selection is. Um, and there's just a little bit more. In each of those lesson plans, it tells you what are the students expected to do at each level. All right. And then um, we'll go ahead and go past this one, but it just kind of points out again what those the differences is between those level one, level two, and level three. We have that independent, supported, and then we're looking for that active participation. All right. The differentiated levels, again, just an image of what it looks like. If you haven't had the opportunity to get into Unique, this is just an example of a comprehension activity. The entire program, the, the, the curriculum that's provided, it, it does have accommodations and some modifications. So you're going to see that even at a level three, this isn't a general education, it, what it looks like a general education curriculum. It is simplified. It does have those multiple choice options. Level two, you're adding on those visual supports and you have that level one where it's simplified. You're, you know, you might have that boundary of you only have one question per page. So very minimized. All right, thematic units. There's an entire year's worth of assessments. This is really neat. If you're looking for a way to support those students in the assessments of support needs or students that have a little bit more need in certain areas, there's instructional guides how to teach a lesson or a certain um, skill um, for the specific, the specific population. So breaking it down, what are those steps and how to provide that instruction? It's a really neat tool that they're adding to as they go along. All right, there's unit checkpoints. So we're looking at how do we prove progress? How do we um, show that our students are making progress in our program? They do have unit checkpoints where you can provide at the beginning of a, a, a unit theme and at the end to see, are they, make, are they making growth? Are we being effective with our teaching um, or do we need to maybe switch things up? Benchmarks, this is just another tool that we can track specific skills. Even we can specifically look at skills that are related to their IEP goals. And then it can show progress over time as well. This part is really exciting to me. Um, with our extensive support needs, it's uh, students, it's always been very hard to find a reading level, especially with our students that are nonverbal. So they've created this new tool, not new, it's been around, but it, um, they've really um, updated it where we can look at our students and, I mean, sorry, I'm assess our students who are verbal or nonverbal and get a grade level for them for their reading, which is really, really exciting. I won't go too, into it too much but something worth looking at. All right, uh, Vanessa was talking earlier about that inclusive access to the diploma. The neat thing is Unique has the materials there for it. There's a way to set up pathways um, and lay out that curriculum. Right now they've set up the pathway. You can do all of them and build them, but right now ELA is ready to go. Um, and it's very exciting, very, very exciting. And it shows how it aligns there. Just some additional, we use a lot of visuals. We talked about that earlier. Um, and there are those within Unique already pre-made. These are just some examples, you know, things that we have around our classrooms. They've added the visual supports, whether it's classroom jobs, a cleanup song, the schedule, there's a sign-in sheet. There's all these different really good activities under core materials or um, resources. There's visual supports for table manners, brushing teeth, washing hands. It really breaks it down step by step. And then um, within there, there's a suggested pacing guide. It's, you know, start, I would start, recommend start small to big. So look at it and see what parts you can tackle and then, you know, move forward on there. 
I think that's all. Oh, additional courses. If you go under courses, there's additional resources. So if you feel like there's, you need a little more math, you need a little more science, um, we want to focus on a certain topic, you can go under there and find some additional sources. I think that's the fastest I've ever talked about unique. <laughs> but, oh, also a really cool, the new N2Y library. This is a great entry point if you're just trying to get familiar with what unique is and the different accessibility tools. So if you go on there, there's leveled readers. Um, again, differentiated, a lot of visuals. Some people might have access to News 2, which is something very similar to the News Weekly that um, is used in the schools, a really awesome um, program as well. And then, of course, we have Symbol Sticks, which is that communication um, tool. It's a symbol library. You can make communication tools. You can make um, different resources or worksheets for your classroom specifically for um, to, to focus on your students' needs. All right. And then if you need any support with Unique, they have those cool little tools to help and support. Any questions you have, there's most likely a tutorial on it and those other buttons as well. And that's it. That was a quick little run over. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.